This is our virtual CME series session one. Uh, it's harm reduction strategies for patients with opioid use disorder with uh, Dr. Kurt Bravada and Dr. Kento Sonata. Um, so my name is Beth Rosemary. I'm the Education Commission co-chair and vice president of the MAFP. Want to thank you for joining us. Uh, this is the first of 10 sessions that the MAFP has planned. Uh, these will be great, convenient, interactive CME, and um, we hope that you'll join us for all of them or as many as you can. Uh, we know it's tempting to turn your camera off during the virtual presentations, but um, we encourage you to please keep your cameras on. This gives our presenters a better feel of who's on the presentation, kind of helps keep you honest so you're not tempted to search for beach vacations. Um, although that sounds better than what we've had the last few days. Uh, and uh, tonight's presenta presentation is live. So the presenters will be available for questions at the end of their talks. Uh, so if you wanna drop a question in the chat uh, as they come up, I'll monitor those and then moderate at the end. Uh, and at the end, if you wanna speak up and ask a question directly, you can do that as well. So tonight's presentation is also being recorded and it'll be uploaded to the MAFP YouTube channel. Uh, the CME is only available for live attendees. Please complete the survey that Bill sent out in the email earlier uh, and the information entered there will be used to report your CME. So without further ado, here are Dr. Kurt Bravada and Dr. Kent Sonoda. Hi everyone. Yeah, so I, I'm uh, Kurt Bravada. So um, I'm a family physician uh, currently practicing in Bolivar and Buffalo, Missouri. Um, I have been um, at uh, Citizens Memorial Healthcare since 2013. I came from New York, which is where I was born and raised. Um, did my training in the Bronx and uh, had a lot of exposure to patients suffering with addictions, particularly um, uh, opioid use disorder and um, stimulant use disorder. Um, and uh, when I came out here to Missouri, I did not expect to be uh, seeing so many patients struggling with various substance use disorders. Um, I guess I really didn't do my research. Um, but uh, I, uh, when I came out here, I was quickly um, uh, made, uh, became clear that there were a lot of patients that were exhibiting drug seeking behavior. And um, I started to look for options for how to treat those patients. And so in 2014, started providing some um, opioid uh, uh, abuse treatment uh, and alcohol um, abuse treatment using uh, Vivitrol. And then in uh, 2017, it was when I got my buprenorphine waiver and then uh, later became board certified in addiction medicine and uh, founded a addiction recovery program here at Citizens Memorial Healthcare, um, which uh, serves uh, the surrounding community. And uh, it's uh, one of the fastest growing programs at our hospital, which um, we say that that's, you know, it's uh, honestly unfortunate to see how, how fast it is growing. Um, and uh, we know that there's an opioid crisis. Um, so uh, I'm going to let uh, Kento introduce himself and uh, then we'll continue with the presentation. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us to tonight. Uh, my name is uh, Kento Sonoda. My parents is he, him, his. Uh, I'm uh, one of the faculty member at the St. Louis University, and I'm serving as a addiction medicine fellowship uh, faculty. So uh, my journey around addiction medicine started when I get into HIV tracking residency. And as you know, there are two ways to get the HIV infection. One is a sexual contact, and the other one is the uh, substance use. And uh, when I I felt very comfortable to talk about this, you know, sexual history and uh, around that history, but even at the end of residency training, I didn't feel comfortable to manage the substance use disorder and also manage the challenging challenging conversation with patient with uh, substance use disorder. So. At the same time, the uh, my former institutions just launched uh, addiction medicine fellowship. So, and then they're just looking for internal uh, resident. Uh, and so, I felt like it's a perfect timing to get into the fellowship. So that's how I get into the addiction medicine fellowship in PA state. And then I did that, and I loved this so much. So I wanted to serve as addiction medicine fellowship uh, faculty member. That's how I found uh, St. Louis University and I joined it. Then uh, 
it's uh, it's my pleasure to foster the future addiction medicine doctors and also work with uh, medical students and the residents uh, interested in addiction medicine. And around the line, um, I love to foster um, educational experience uh, for those who don't have like expertise around addiction. So uh, I'm serving as a Midwest Society of Addiction Medicine Education committee chair and also i'm doing the carbsider addiction medicine uh, associate editor so you can uh, please check out the podcast whenever you can so uh that's me uh thank you so much uh for joining us today so i yes, talk to you and dr bravada thank you kento and uh i do have the pleasure of serving um uh, alongside kento uh with asam as the um, midwest uh regional um, uh, secretary, and uh, I'm also vice chair and uh, co-founder of the CMDA. Uh, this is Christian Medical and Dental Association's addiction medicine section. So um, our learning objectives today, uh, number one, are uh, to appreciate the scope of the opioid abuse crisis. Number two, to understand the basic concepts of harm reduction. Number three, to become familiar with the principles of opioid replacement therapy. And so uh, we would just uh, like to ask at this time that everyone um, have uh, their mics uh, muted um, and not have any electronic other electronic devices on and uh, that we be uh, cordial and respectful of each other as we communicate through the chat. Uh, neither Kento nor I have any conflicts of interest at this time. So uh, let's talk a little bit about epidemiology. Uh, in the United States, 5.6 million people age um, uh, 12 uh, or older um, in 2001 suffered from um, uh, opioid use disorder. And the predicted number of deaths uh, between July 2022 20, um, uh, and June 2023 um, was uh, as seen here on the screen. Um, and let's see, so you can follow the graph here. Um, I think this was one that Kento added. Um, do you have anything you want to speak about uh, regarding the graph here, Kento? Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, so basically the, the predicted number of death has been increasing and in the United States. And that's why it's uh, critical important critical important to understand how to treat the OUD uh, nowadays, and then I I'm going to touch on the local data uh, now. Thank you. Okay. Oh, go ahead. So this is the local data uh, in state. Um. So, so as you see, uh, from for the past uh, five to six years the number of all drug overdose death has been increasing. Uh, 2023 data are not available as, as of today, but as, see, as you see in 2022, the, the total number was 2,180 uh, death uh, from the drug use. So it's been worsening. So we, we need to stop this trend. Um, that's, uh, that's why uh, we are here to talk about it. Uh, next slide. So this is the local data, and as the color gets um, darker, uh, there are more overdose death. And and so as, as you see, so the St. Louis uh, region is the worst, and then the Kansas City area be the next. And then if you look at the county levels, so at the, there's a St. Louis on the right side, there's St. Louis County and St. Louis City region. And then at the other area, it's a kind of darker and a, a dark purple color is Jackson County around the Kansas City area. Uh, next slide. So this is the numbers uh, from top one to 10. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of very unfortunate, but the top two are in St. Louis, uh, St. Louis County and uh, St. Louis City. And, but the third top is a uh, Jackson County. It's around the Kansas City. And the fourth one is a uh, Green County, which is around the Springfield. So, you know, look at the where you live, but the 
this is what we have uh, in Missouri. And it's important to understand the epidemiology and the numbers uh, based upon where, li where you live because that's ha you're happening in your community. Uh, next slide. So the question is, should we treat OUD, right? Yes. Uh, so we already seen that lots of uh, patients uh, with uh, OUD in our practice. And I'm pretty sure you have prescribed opioids uh, for the chronic pain. And so I I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but the just as a matter of fact, 75% of those who began their opioid misuse in 2000 reported their first regular opioid use was a prescription drug. So it's coming from us. And it, I think it's it just a fact. And I see that many patients who got injured or got the surgery and they started on the opioid, and then they had like a little bit of leftover and you know, kept it or then took it a little bit extra and then they felt good and they wanted to keep taking it or uh, they started on opioid and they still wanted to stay on the opioid, but I think the physicians stopped it uh, because I think the acute phase was, in, was ended, but the patient w still wanted to take it, so started to seek out the drugs from the community and then then escalated into heroin or fentanyl. That's pretty common pathway too. But I just wanted to highlight the factor around the opioid prescription from us. Next slide. Yes, uh, so again, treating OUD saves lives. And uh, I wanted to touch on a couple of stats too. Next slide. So harm reduction, this is our title today, but the the, the use of OUD, Opioid agonist methadone and bup reduces the overdose, illicit drug use, and trans transmissions of infectious diseases like HIV and Hep C. And those with uh, medications as a part of treatment are seventy five percent less likely to die due to substance use disorder compared with those who didn't get it. That's a huge. Uh, so it's um we don't have that effective medication other than uh, opioid agonist and so it's a really effective medication if uh, we uh, use the medication for the appropriate uh, patient populations next slide so and also it's cost effective and uh, it's good for reducing crime too every one dollar invested in substance use treatment returns a yield of 47 bucks in reducing drug-related crimes and criminal justice and theft. And, you know, the addiction treatment may not, you know, create lots of financial benefit for the clinic, but that would save lots of money and the financial, um, like a, that can save the financial cost in the future. So it's more so preventive services. Okay, so uh, just a little bit of education around the language. Uh, I often hear the term MAT, uh, which is stand for medication assisted uh, treatment. Uh, it's uh, often used for like a basically like medication for uh, SUD, but it's more uh, accurate than appropriate to say medications for o OUD because the medication is not necessarily assisted, uh, it's a medication. So the MOUD, uh, whereas uh, as called uh, medications for OUD is more appropriate. And so patient can learn a healthy coping and life skills, and also they can get the job once they get situated, and also they can take care of family and engage in medical and recovery care. So all good uh, once they get situated from the treatment. Next slide. And also it's important to understand as a fine medicine doc, SUD is a chronic disease. They got nothing special other than uh, compared with other chronic diseases like hypertension or asthma. If you look at the prevalence and uh, how common it is, like it's uh, 
we, we should um, take the CD as a part of the current conditions, as you see on the graph. Uh, next slide. And again, OUD is a chronic disease because uh, everyone is susceptible to develop OUD. Yes, there are some risk factors and uh, there's a uh, genetic components too, but it can happen to anyone. And so, you know, you, you may not realize uh, how common it is and uh, we cannot tell from the appearance and uh, something happens uh, in life and many patients never like, thought of getting the OUD in their lifetime. Uh, I have a couple of patients like someone, like one of the friend was um, using and then just tried it one time and then couldn't get out from it. And it just, uh, just one time use can change the life. And I have uh, the other patient, he's like 18 years old and he just tried it one time and then he had overdose. And so just one time use can uh, affect the life. And so it's important to remember that the OUD can uh, happen to anyone. Next slide. And also treating OUD reduces the disease spread. It can uh, improve the HIV incidence, hep C incidence, and also that can reduce the IE incidence too. So all good. it's it's great treatment. Uh, next slide. Okay, so this is something I, I love to talk about. And this is something I uh, gave a lecture at the last year annual conference for the MAFP. But the uh, there are lots of factors leading to MOUD stigma. And I want to share some of those. So framing of SUD as a willful choice, not the disease. So it, it's not in in many situations like the it's not the matter of their weakness it's 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 a disease so it's uh there are, there are lots of misunderstanding around it and and also it's very common that the cd is being treated as a separate treatment uh, from the primary care and that's why it's important to integrate uh, sud into a part of primary care and also there's so much stigma language around it. You know, for instance, like junkie or like a dirty urine or something like that. And so it's imp so important to utilize the appropriate language in the field of addiction medicine. And also justice systems, uh, lack of recognition for MOED as an option for medical treatment for individuals with SUD. And that's why uh, I am being involved in the advocacy around the addiction medicine and uh, as a system and as a whole, as a state, uh, it's important to tackle the justice system and uh, 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 healthy inequity around the MOUD and OUD. Next slide. All right. So this is a fun part and I like to hear from uh, audience and what do you think about the harm reduction and uh, what kind of image you have around addiction? Uh, sorry, harm reduction. So it'd be great if you can type in the chat or be great if you can unmute yourself. You know, again, this is safe uh, environment. So it'd be great uh, if you can share whatever you, you think and you, you cannot go wrong with it uh, about this question. Well, this is Miller. I'll start. Um, Thank you. I really like your uh, inclusion of harm reduction to include reduced HIV, Hep C, and infectious endocarditis. I hadn't really thought about that. I know it's out there, but that's a really good point. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. So addiction involves, you know, lots of aspects, right? So just not the uh, OED itself. It involves. Uh, infectious conditions too. Thank you so much for touching on that. And also I got the comment more effective than abstinence. Yes, thank you so much. Harm reduction equals aiming for risk reduction as opposed to perfection. 
Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So, oh, and I also I got another comment. Thank you so much. Concept that a cure and abstinence are not the only positive outcome. Yes. Yeah, so the many of us and uh, I sometimes do like tend to look at the abstinence as only positive outcome. But we need to be uh, coincident and mindful of uh, take breaking out the steps into a bit more smaller because it's far out from daily use of fentanyl to recover like abstinence. And also not everyone has the same goal. So it's important to check with the patient and then what, what they're at and then we need to respect what they want to do. And this is a definition from SAMHSA. So I want to, uh, you know, read a come out some of the main points, but basically SAMHSA so defined uh, harm reduction as practical, oh, practical and transformative approach. And that, that incorporates the committee driven public health strategies and to empower people who use drugs and their families with their choice to live healthy, self-driven, and purpose-filled lives. And also, it's important to note that, that these strategies and the practices that flow from them. So as I mentioned a little bit, it's, it's on themselves. It's not from us. It's, it's up to them. And it's, uh, the key point is to... Uh, understand that this concept is coming from the patient lenses, not from our lenses. Uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, the blanks ne next, yeah. So this is uh, the one that I wanna share with you. So Dr. Bravada, can you stop sharing and then I will share my screen. Okay, if I pause share, will that work? No, you stop. need to stop. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is a YouTube, and I hope you can hear this. Can you hear this? Okay, good. As far as engaging people around overdose prevention, now I'm talking about opioid use or people who are using opioids, I find it's more helpful to talk to them about what they're going to do when they see someone else overdose. It's also important to talk to them about the concrete steps they're going to take when they overdose, but I, I think that a lot of people are motivated to change their behavior based on what they've observed in other people. In my personal experience in talking to patients and their families, um, an overdose is more traumatic an experience for the person who observes the overdose than the person who um, experiences the overdose. Most overdoses, you know, people are revived and they, they feel okay afterwards and they don't even remember, remember what happened. But for the person who's there witnessing it, that can be very traumatic. And um, that's why when I talk to patients, I ask them about their own overdose experiences and I ask them about um, the overdoses they've witnessed. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, can you back on the slide? So now that he is talking about, you know, how impactful it is, the over overdose it is uh, for the patients with OUD. And so it's important. I just wanted to share kind of the aspect from the one of the national leader. And so now I'd like to share some of the supporting principles uh, around the harm reduction. First of all, it's really important to respect the autonomy. Again, I wanna respect what they wanna do. That's why I 
always ask with a patient what what is your goal and what do you think would work best for you and unless like that would harm the patient i will respect what they want to do because if you just uh, force what you want to do they may just say yes in front of you and then they may not come back in front of you and um, so that's why to me the respecting autonomy is critically important next one uh then uh, cultivate the relationship it's kind of related to the autonomy piece but to me relationship is critically important it might be the most important one i want to make the patient feel like this is the home let's say home that they can come back when i see the patient as a first visit you know they are super motivated and they feel like they can do it but it's not that easy and they may not be able to come back but um i at least i like to be the home for them and to come back uh, whenever it's ready for them and they want to commit themselves to the treatment again and so i i say no matter what happens please come back and i'll be here to assist you and then that's when patient come back and uh, request me uh, to see them and i that's why i think having the good relationship and having rapport is critically important next and then assist not direct it's kind of uh, similar with autonomy but it's not not assisting or directing the pa no, sorry not directing the patient what to do it's a matter of how to assist the patient and what they want to do next and then promote the safety uh it's a piece i'm i'm going to touch on later on but you know if if they die we cannot save save or help them so it's uh, one of the most important piece to emphasize whenever i see the patient for instance uh i ask them like when you use the drugs do you use it by yourself or do you use it with others or do you have need a narcot home or something like that and then if they don't know like i need like apps that they can use they can never use alone or the brave app uh, those app can uh like uh, for instance, if they turn on or use that app, and uh, someone be with them anonymously, and then uh, they will keep checking with them, and then if they stop responding to their communication, the nine one one be automat automatically called, and then GPS is tagged with the app, so the nine one one be called and they be rescued uh, by the EMS, something like that. Uh, next. And then prioritize that listening again to respect what they want to do and to cultivate the relationship. You need to listen. Yes, uh, you have tons of things you want to say to the patient, and uh, those patients tend to have lots of many, uh, lots of uh, medical conditions. But you need to be, you know, step back a little bit and then be patient and uh, need to prioritize and um, uh, be patient with uh, listening what they want to say. I think I got the comment. Could you name those apps? Yes, I will never use Dawn or the Brave. I have a Brave one uh, in my phone and I will I always share with the patient. All right, so now I just wanna check with the audience again. What can we do to practice the harm reduction? So it'd be great if you can share some of the examples that you can think of for the harm reduction strategies. I kind of named it a little bit, but. You can type in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so 
Oh, create the agenda uh, for visit together. Yes, thank you so much for your comment. Yes. And uh, it would be great to have more time in Mexico. Oh, yes. Uh, someone said the, they, they wish they have more time to spend the needed time. Yes. Thank you. All right. So I there's nothing like um, clear cut the right answers, but let me share some of the practice strategies that, that I thought of. Uh, next slide. So first off, the motivational interviewing. Uh, so basically it's um, kind of respect the autonomy and then kind of enhance their internal motivation. And then it's um, it's driven by uh, their motivation. And that's a skill I think I always use and I talk about with uh, learners. And again, yes, you wanna make sure they have access to Norcan uh, just in case and uh, not necessarily just for them, it's a very common that, that they tend to observe or encounter the overdose situations. So I would just uh, generalize that, you know, it's important to carry the Narcan and so that you can save others. And uh, I say that for myself too. I, I have Narcan uh, for my, uh, in my bag too, and so that I can save others. And also if there is, uh, you know, syringe exchange program uh, can be used as a tool for uh, harm reduction. I, when I was in the PA state, I served as a wound care provider and a physician at the one of the syringe exchange program in Pittsburgh. And it, it was very rewarding experience because uh, many patients are not ready to uh, stop using drugs, but they are ready to talk about like, where to inject or how to inject or how to use it. Like uh, instead of using uh, IV, uh, they are interested in using uh, from other sites or something like that. So it is a very rewarding experience to uh, for me like, how to talk about it. And then the other piece is like, I, I said like plan A, B, C. Uh, that what it means is that you know you would ask with them them like what do you, what do you want to do and what just in case when you get triggered, what do you, what do you do? And then they may say, okay, I will uh, take a deep breath or something like that. I will call that strategy as a plan A and, but it may not work, right? Then I would challenge them again. Hey, if, if that doesn't happen, what do you do? Which is plan B and and then I kind of keep asking them like till the plan C uh, sometimes, and uh, in that way, uh, you you can like build up a more reliable and uh, mm, yeah reliable plan for the patient uh, to prevent against uh, overdose. And then again, as I mentioned a little bit, uh, I I talk about the overdose uh, detection app uh, to the patient too. Okay, and I think I got. Oh yeah, buy and carry the resuscitation mask with one way above. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for sharing. And and also, I wanted to share one of the good resources for the patient and your knowledge. Uh, this website was developed by uh, mainly by uh, Yale uh, Yale School of Medicine uh, Addiction Medicine team and uh, also podcast uh, Addiction Medicine. Uh, outside our team members and I think I thought that this website is very helpful and I posted the link on the chat so uh, you can use that and this website for your learning and also you can uh, share this uh, link with the patient or health uh, staff member to learn more about the uh, um, harm reduction tools and a safer injection okay so uh, I think this is it from my end. Uh, right. But if if we have any questions, uh, I'm happy to take it. Then, then thank you. All right, thank you, Kanto. Um, so, uh, so we're going to talk about um, OUD treatment options. And uh, one thing I'd like to say, just starting off here, is that you know, although we're employing 
science here, um, you know, through the medications that we prescribe and, you know, we talk a little bit about this, the science that goes behind that. There really is an art to OUD treatment. And um, so I know sometimes um, providers who are interested in getting involved in providing OUD treatment, they, they want specifics. And so we'll provide as many specifics as we can, but this really is a brief overview. But um, for those of us who have been in it for a while, we've recognized that there really is um, patient-driven strategy is, is really what it comes down to. Um, and so, um, so you have a patient that comes to you seeking treatment. And so um, they may be actively using, they may be intermittently using, they may not have used for a while and they're just wanting you to help them stay sober. And so you have to start there. What is their substance of abuse? Is it one substance? Is it multiple substances? Are they actively using? If they're actively using um, and they're intoxicated, do we have to detox them? And you know, can they detox in the outpatient setting or can they? do they have to be in the hospital? And it really comes down to what their substance of abuse is you know, for stimulants, methamphetamines, uh, cocaine, um, that you really don't typically need to hospitalize them unless there's some psychosis or delirium. Um, benzodiazepine and alcohol withdrawal um, may require inpatient uh, detox, um, and, and that would be uh, based on their CWA scale um, or just their general presentation in the office. Um, for uh, OUD, Although you may feel like you're dying, uh, typically, um, you know, the, the, uh, exp um, the side effects of opioid uh, withdrawal um, are typically not life-threatening. Um, and so those typically can be done in the outpatient setting. And so um, now uh, you want to provide counseling or peer support. Um, so in, in my practice, we have a counselor. We also have a peer recovery specialist who is someone who actually recovered in our program. And now she helps other patients um, by uh, meeting with them in the office, doing some group visits, um, connecting with uh, patients in the emergency room, in the birthplace, on med surge, um, and also calling patients to follow up with them and see how they're doing. And sometimes if a patient calls in and, you know, they're struggling, we'll just connect them with our peer recovery specialist. And she does such a great job one-on-one -on -one talking to them because she knows where, uh, you know, where they're coming from because she's been there too. Um, and um, so now as uh, treatment providers, we can provide counseling ourselves, but it really is helpful to have a behavioral health specialist provide that service as well. Um, and that could be a um, licensed pract practical counselor, an LPC, which is what uh, we have. We also do have psychologists um, through our uh, psychiatry uh, behavioral health department, um, and we have LCSWs that we can also refer to. Um, so buprenorphine is the, you know, uh, is, 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 more commonly being used for opioid replacement therapy than any other, uh, well, than methadone. Although uh, traditionally methadone um, had been standard of care for opioid replacement therapy, but really buprenorphine has been found to be much safer. safer. Um, it is a partial agonist at the mu opioid receptor. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And, and that can be um, prescribed um, or administered through um, an office-based opioid treatment program or an, uh, a certified opioid treatment program. Now for methadone, um, that currently is, you're only allowed to um, prescribe that. You can prescribe it in emergency situations, you can prescribe it in the hospital, or you can prescribe it, which is really being administered um, and dispensed through the um, certified opioid treatment program. But there's some legislation and definitely advocacy behind that to try to um, make methadone uh, available through the office-based setting. Um, uh, naltrexone um, is a antagonist at the mu opioid receptor. And uh, this one um, is uh, available in the oral form and also in the uh, uh, depot form. Um, 
it's a good place to start for those who uh, are a little hesitant to start buprenorphine um, because it's non-opioid, non-habit forming, um, really uh, no major risks of uh, side effects. Um, the only major medication interaction is uh, with opioids, um, although it does block some of your natural endorphins, which are released, um, like your beta endorphins, which are released when you drink alcohol. So you, you, you want to consider the effects that it has for someone who's using alcohol. Um, but it's, it's very, very safe. And you may want to consider caution uh, in someone who has uh, liver failure. Um, so, uh, and uh, referral to short or long-term residential treatment. So this is going to be for uh, the patient who uh, potentially has uh, detoxed in the hospital, um, uh, someone who's a heavy user, um, oftentimes for alcoholics, or for someone who's failed uh, outpatient treatment. And for someone in that scenario, you may want to um, uh, refer them or direct admit them to a residential treatment. So um, we're talking here about um, uh, OUD uh, treatment approaches and rates of adherence. Um, so as you can see here, uh, there's some similarity between uh, buprenorphine and methadone in terms of rates of adherence. Um, and that's because opioid replacement therapy works uh, for OUD. Um, naltrexone, uh, a little bit less so. Um, and, and there's different reasons for that. You know, it is available in the depot form. And so that's, that lasts uh, at least 30 days. Um, and, and for those patients, if you can get it administered, you know, they're going to do fairly well, but it's, it's hard getting them to, to, to come in for the injection. Um, and then if you're prescribing it orally, they have to remember to take it every day and they don't really experience much positive benefit from the medication itself. They don't really feel like they're taking anything, um, you know, after that first dose. And so they don't really feel a strong motivation to take it, um, for detox and then abstinence. So these, you know, this is where we kind of talk about abstinence-based programs and, um, you know, although there is a place for it and there is a particular type of patient who's ready for that type of abstinence-based uh, program, someone who's highly motivated, maybe someone who's not a heavy user, someone who maybe hasn't used in a while and they just uh, had one relapse, something like that. Um, it's, it, you, you really want to take advantage of the medications that we have because you're going to significantly decrease their relapse and you're going to improve their rate of adherence to programs. And someone who's on a medication that blocks those opioid receptors, they are much more likely to, uh, well, they're going to be more clear headed. They're going to be um, less anxious. Um, they're going to ha not have that drug seeking behavior and they're going to be more likely to want to engage in the behavioral aspect of recovery. Um, so you can, this is just kind of reiterating that point. You can see here um, on this graph, um, you have the x-axis, which is your months in treatment, your y-axis, um, uh, which is uh, the percent um, of uh, adherence to uh, and retention in the program. And so then you have your green line there, which is opioid negative for the past month. And then the blue line still in treatment. And you can see that as you uh, progress um, in time, those who are on opioid replacement therapy with buprenorphine are more likely to stay in treatment. So here's some good news. Um, and we definitely think it's good news because we need an army of people who are um, providing um, opioid replacement therapy through their practices that you don't need an X waiver to prescribe buprenorphine any longer. And this is a really important point because I know for me and for many doctors, for many uh, mid-levels who are considering prescribing buprenorphine, just the very concept that you need to have a special X waiver to be able to prescribe it created this stigma around buprenorphine and it created a fear factor that you need some extra training because it must be dangerous. It must be a scary medication because, you know, precipitated opioid withdrawal, which everyone's afraid of, you know, am I going to put a patient into withdrawal by blocking those opioid receptors? You know, is it, you know, is that going to, um, you know, cause the patient to become violently ill in the office or is there going to be diversion all these different things? because of that X waiver. And the other thing is, is that this idea that because there's this DEA X waiver, 
that the DA is going to come and storm your office because you're providing opioid replacement therapy. And, and, and now that they've really gotten rid of that, I think we're going to see a lot more people getting involved in addiction treatment. And I really hope so, because it's really something that we need. Um, so, uh, so buprenorphine, so, uh, buprenorphine, uh, commonly comes in uh, a form combined with naloxone. And we're not really talking about name brands here because we're trying to avoid that, but um, many of you will recognize the name brand of the form most commonly prescribed uh, that's formulated with naloxone. Um, and so um, something to understand about the naloxone is the way it is formulated is that, that naloxone molecule um, is, is not significantly absorbed um, into the bloodstream through the GI tract or sublingually. Now, that doesn't mean that you won't get some naloxone in your system, but um, the point is, is that naloxone, which causes um, opioid uh, withdrawal and, and is used um, you know, in, in the case of overdoses, if that is to get directly into your bloodstream, you are going to go into opioid withdrawal if you're on an opioid. And so the first thing you need to know is that when you're taking buprenorphine combined with naloxone, it's the buprenorphine that's being absorbed, okay? Now, if someone tries to dilute it, you know, melt it down, uh, melt the medication down and then inject it into uh, a vein, um, then it's going to end up in their bloodstream and that is gonna put them into opioid withdrawal. So that is why it is formulated that way. Um, it's to be a deterrent for um, IV drug abuse uh, with this medication um, and to try to decrease its street value because they can't use it that way. Um, now, you can prescribe buprenorphine uh, without naloxone, and there might be some reasons why you do that. Um, one might be um, insurance preference um, for the medication. It might be because uh, the patient that um, has been taking it uh, with the naloxone, um, uh, doesn't, um, you know, has some intolerance to the preparation, you know, the, the, the film. Um, some people really have a dislike to the gel-like substance that forms when you stick it under your tongue. Um, uh, others uh, might uh, say that they experience um, they, they, they experience some um, negative side effects from the naloxone, which if you check their drug screen and there's some naloxone in their, in their drug screen, they're absorbing some of it. I, I know technically that's not supposed to happen, but I definitely have seen it. Although you do have to be careful that they're not falsifying their drug screen by dipping their buprenorphine naloxone strip directly into their urine. Um, and you can tell that by levels and uh, the, the um, uh, uh, creatinine and um, uh, some other things that can help you understand if there's an adulterant in there. Um, but uh, so um, if used correctly, uh, the buprenorphine is going to help um, treat their cravings, but it's also going to treat their withdrawal. So if they come into the office, they're in withdrawal. And that's the thing. When you start it, they need to be in some level of withdrawal. Um, or the other way is that they have not used an opioid for enough time that the risk of precipitated withdrawal is not a concern. Um, but let's say that there was someone who um, they used yesterday, 12 to 24 hours ago, they'll probably be, be in mild to moderate withdrawal and, and you can start them on a sublingual dose. Um, if they haven't used in a week, you really don't have to worry about um, withdrawal. Um, if it's been uh, you know a few weeks, a month, you may want to consider whether this is the right medication for them, but if they're a high risk of relapse and they have done well on this medication before, um, you may want to get them back on it. Um, so um, you, you do want to consider that this is a, it's a synthetic opioid. So there are some drug-drug interactions, but, but not, not a ton, but you want to think about, um, you want to think about uh, interactions with uh, opioids. Um, you want to think about interactions with benzos, with sedative hypnotics. Um, if you go to prescribe this, um, your EMR, if it runs a drug to drug interaction, it might give you an interaction with methamphetamine uh, or with amphetamines, um, like your ADHD meds. 
but really they're doing opposite things. One's a stimulant, you know, one's going to be more of a sedative. So um, you don't have to worry about that too much. Um, so uh, the average daily dose is 16 milligrams. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how you get to that dose. Um, rarely up to 24, but you may, and you know, someone who has chronic pain or who just is, you know, who pa pain is driving their opioid use. So they may need a higher dose um, or uh, they're just not, um, they were heavy users and they're just, you know, or they're high opioid metabolizers. So they're not getting the benefit that they need. Um, we say that there's a hard stop at 32 milligrams, but there's some uh, research regarding whether or not that has to be a hard stop. And, you know, you do have to kind of use your judgment, um, you know, like heavy fentanyl users, sometimes they can be very difficult to treat. Um, so um, it's important to note this drug is safe. Um, you know, what I like to say to um, anyone who has prescribed opioids in the past, um, <laughs> if, if you've prescribed opioids, you should not be afraid of buprenorphine. I mean, if you had a bad experience prescribing opioids, maybe, but if you, if you prescribe opioids and you do it on a regular basis, you should not be afraid of prescribing buprenorphine. In fact, you should feel much more comfortable prescribing buprenorphine. And it doesn't take more than one to two patients. You have to just have to start somewhere. And once you do, you're going to feel, you're, you're going to be really convinced that this is a good medication. Um, Encourage your patients not to be um, mixing with benzos or alcohol, but I have to say there are some patients who are benzo dep dependent and you may not be able to get them off their benzo, but you just have to really proceed with caution. Um, so um, uh, it, it does raise serotonin levels. And so some patients do say they feel like a little more energized and that, you know, you also have to think about is you know, the dope, the dopamine agonist effect and, and that there's a dopamine deficit in those that are suffering from addiction and they're self-medicating to treat that in many cases. And so it does help um, level out their dopamine levels. Um, patients do not typically, you know, I, I'm not sure I a hundred percent agree with this statement. Um, although technically it's people, patients don't build a high tolerance to it. I would say that, um, for the most part, patients do get on a stable dose and they'll stay on that for a long time, but sometimes they do need their dose to be increased. Um, so as far as uh, with the elderly, um, it's, it's less impairing. Um, so, uh, you know, it's cognitively impairing, um, less fall risk, um, you know, less uh, problems with decision-making, um, less likely to exacerbate, um, you know, some of their cognitive issues. Um, we definitely have, I have patients who are in their 70s that are on this, not too many, but I do have some. Um, does not affect the QT interval, which methadone does. So methadone um, can cause cardiac arrhythmias. So you have to, uh, you know, keep that in mind with methadone, but for buprenorphine, um, less likely to have that problem. Um, and um, so it's safe in uh, renal insufficiency or renal failure. Um, it, it, it does have some effect on, 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 on the liver, but um, really I, I've never really had a situation in which I had to stop buprenorphine because of a liver issue. Um, it's easier to wean than other opioids. I mean, I have patients, they run out of it and they don't experience severe withdrawal. They might feel increased cravings uh, for opioids, but um, they tend to not have any severe withdrawal symptoms. Um, so, we talked about, you know, this is more in some ways more of an art than a science. And um, uh, the science to it is, you know, start low, go slow, um, but also allow the patient, especially if they have used buprenorphine before, they kind of know how much they can tolerate and, and they can titrate up on their own um, very well. Um, so, and, and many of them have taken that first dose on the street on their own without any doctor to guide them. Um, it happens all the time. Um, so home inductions are totally, um, I don't think we go into that really here, but you can do home inductions, especially for a patient who, um, I mean, during COVID, we did that a lot more uh, via telehealth. Um, and, and there's uh, scenarios in which patients, you know, they're not able to get into the office. Um, but typically for that first visit, I mean, you, you want to see them in person, um, but there are scenarios in which, you know, maybe you haven't seen them for a while and they're like, doc, I really need to get back on my buprenorphine. You might want to send them a prescription. Um, 
And uh, so um, your goal is to titrate them to a point at which they're not experiencing withdrawal symptoms where they have no or minimal cravings. They, and then you don't want to titrate them, titrate them up to the point where they're having side effects. And uh, there's something that, you know, people who are family members of, of patients who've been on buprenorphine or methadone, they say, oh yeah, they're always nodding off. They always seem drugged. Well, that's because <laughs> I always tell, you know, family members, you know, or others who say that they feel like people with buprenorphine seem drugged. A lot of times that has to do with doctors prescribing too high of a dose too quickly or the patients mixing it with benzos, or they're mixing it with alcohol, or they're not even taking their buprenorphine and they're on some other opioid. So you just don't know, but if you're prescribing appropriately, they should not seem cognitively impaired. Um, and if they're taking it appropriately. Um, so, and your, your goal is, this is the harm reduction side of it is, for them to discontinue or markedly reduce use of other opioids. And so this is where you're going to have to use your own judgment because there's going to be times where, you know, you're going to find out that they went ahead and got something on the street. And is that the point at which you say, you know, should I be, you know, continuing to give this patient this medication? And if you develop a relationship with them and you can communicate with them, or you can have your peer recovery specialist or social worker or counselor talk to them, and you feel like that they, they have really bought into their recovery and they just had a slip up, you really don't want to stop treatment. That's like the worst thing you could do, because imagine if they had that slip up and they didn't have buprenorphine, they might've continued to use heavily and then overdosed. And so the, the greatest harm redu reduction is to save a life. Um, but also to have them, you know, engage in, um, recovery, to take care of their families, to be able to go to work, to be able to um, start taking care of their health. That's one thing that we really don't, you know, you don't think about a lot. These patients are not receiving primary care when they're seeking drugs. Once, you know, and, and they could have festering wounds, all these different things, and, and they don't even seem to care about it because they're just thinking about their drug. Um, so, Typically, you start with four milligrams. If you're really, really nervous and it's your first patient, you might do two milligrams. But um, in, in most cases, four milligrams is totally fine for just about every patient. Um, and uh, so, you again, you can do a home induction, but uh, ideally, you want to have them in the office. You give them that first dose. You tell them to hold it under their tongue until it's dissolved. Um, you you um, recommend that um, they don't swallow until it's uh, um, dissolved. You might tell them to put their chin down so that it, you know, it, it's not because whatever you're swallowing is very little of that is absorbed into your system um, through the GI tract. So um, you want to wait. Uh, so after that first dose, um, ideally you want to wait, you know, uh, one to two hours. So they say about 90 minutes. Um, you know, Kento can, can talk about some of his tips maybe after this, but, um, you know, uh, sometimes you are strapped for time and you may not have that amount of time, but I do think it's ideal to do that. Um, and then, you know, if they tolerate it fine, um, you can uh, titrate up. Now you may not titrate them all the way up to 16 milligrams on that first day. You're gonna give them some uh, medication for them to take home on that first prescription, or you might send them to the pharmacy to pick up additional and you tell them first day, let's try not to go past 16 milligrams. You may not need that much, you know, wait every couple hours to see how you're feeling. Maybe wait four hours, see how you're feeling. If you're experiencing continued um, symptoms of cravings or opioid withdrawal, take another dose. Um, and then over the next couple of days, maybe you're getting up to um, 20 to 24 milligrams, but you really don't need to, you know, that's only if symptoms are uh, continuing. Um, see the patient back the next day, see them back, you know, in three days. The main thing is you want to see them back as soon as you can. Um, this is a really important point. Um, how long should someone be on buprenorphine? And um, I, I hate to say indefinitely, um, but that's kind of the answer. Um, the answer is as long as it's helping the patient. You know, you. Um, so, so when you start insulin on a patient, you know, a patient's going to say to you, "Well, how long, doc, do I have to be on this insulin?" And you're going to say, well, 
as you may be on it your whole life, you know, if you lose the weight, you know, in a, in a type two diabetic, you know, if you develop the skills to be able to, you know, control your diet, increase your exercise, all these lifestyle modifications that you can do to get control of your life. Yeah. Maybe you'll come off the insulin. It's the same way with buprenorphine. If they can get control of their life and they can change their habits, they can change their environment, you know, because that's a big thing. You know, what are the triggers around them? If they're around the same people that they've been using with, if they have the same temptations around them, if they have, um, you know, a lot of stress in their life, which might be a trigger for them. There's so many different things. If they're, if they're going through a divorce, if, you know, um, holidays, you know, um, certain anniversaries, things like that are big triggers, you know, definitely get them through that first year, you know, and, and, and beyond that, you know, I have patients that are, that I've been seeing for years and, and we just talk about it every visit. Is this still working for you? You know, are you thinking about uh, decreasing your dose? No doc, this is really working well for me. I, I, I just, I feel great. I've never felt better. Why would you decrease it? You know, it's like arbitrarily decreasing insulin when it's, you know, I mean, of course, get them on a G GLP one, you might want to take them off their insulin. But so far, we don't have a, another solution other than um, uh, MOUD for uh, op um, opioid um, abuse disorder. So, um, uh, so let's see. Uh, let's go. Okay, so I think that's pretty much. Uh, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to say there. Um, so I think we have some questions in the chat and Kento, since you've kind of probably been looking at them. Uh, let's see. I, I don't think we have like a question, no question. question at this point. I made a couple of comments. Okay. Uh, okay. So oh, Danny. Now we just well, got the asked, question. Yeah, there is a question in the chat. Okay. So could you, we, are, we, uh, we are past seven 30. So um, okay. I just want to be mindful if people have to leave that. Yeah. Please. So if anybody has to get off that, that is um, totally fine. Um, so question here is, could you comment on the use of buprenorphine alone or, okay, so, so, or with naltrexone? So be, as far as buprenorphine, um, so you definitely would not use it with naltrexone, but buprenorphine with naloxone, um, uh, you, uh, so now naltrexone, uh, Kenza, do you want to speak to this? Because um, I think I did address this somewhat, but if you might have another perspective on that question. Yeah, for the current pain one. Uh, so could you comment on the use of buprenorphine alone yeah. or with it's naloxone, I think is the question. Yeah, sure. So I, I think when someone have like an OUD and chronic pain, I use the uh, bup uh, over uh, naltrexone because the bup uh, can help the chronic pain. Actually, this is a great comment because I just wrote the article uh, for the MAFP from Physician Magazine uh, at the last issue, how to address the chronic pain in patients with uh, OUD on buprenorphine. So exactly the same topic that I just wrote in the article. But anyway, so when someone have a chronic pain and I, when you use a bup, um, instead of the BID, it works if you spit out. So let's say if someone taking 16 per day, like an 8 milligram BID, I often do like a, like a 4 milligram QID instead of 8 milligram BID because the the bup works uh, for like 12 hours or so for craving and withdrawal symptoms, but it doesn't work well for chronic pain because of half time, uh, yeah, half time. So I use the 4 milligram uh, QID instead and that, that works pretty well. And, and uh, I can quickly touch on the methadone one too. Uh, when would you want to consider methadone instead? That's a great question. I think when we start uh, MOUD, I talk to the patient, hey, there are mainly three medications uh, for OUD, methadone, bup, slash um, buprenorphine, and uh, naloxone, and uh, natrexin. And kind of explain like, how it works and what, what are requirements. That I think that many patients don't know what they have to do around the methadone. Typically, they have to go to methadone clinic every single morning for the couple months, and then it takes time to get to the therapeutic dosage for them. And for those who have transport issue issues, 
it can be really challenging to go to the methadone clinic every single day for a couple months. And that's a common uh, misunderstanding around the methadone. But as long as they understand what they need to do with it, I think methadone uh, works pretty well for MOED. So I think it's a matter of expectation and uh, in, uh, making sure you you be on the same page with the patient when when you just when you talk about the MOED. Mm-hmm. And you. so I'll, I'll answer uh, uh, Brad's uh, question here about how to handle um, uh, opioid replacement therapy around surgeries, dental procedures. Do you continue it or taper off prior? Also, how do you get our fellow physicians um, and APPs to join us in treating OED? So, um, so I think um, the so there's different guidelines on you know whether you should taper or, or how how long before a procedure that they should stop the medication. Um, it, it also it really has a lot to do with the conversations you're having with the surgeon because they're going to want to know and they're going to have some anxiety about the patient being on that medication unless they're very familiar with them being on it um, because they don't want it to interact with anything that they might prescribe. Um, but th- from my perspective, I'm thinking a lot too about you know are they having a pain issue prior to surgery is that is is the the surgical indication painful is are they you know did they have an injury you know do they have some other underlying condition that's painful and they need you know some sort of pain management so the, the idea of just taking them off of their medication you know like a week before or something like that it's really not feasible because you know, one, you don't want them to, to use an overdose prior to surgery Two, they might have pain. And so you don't want to just stop it. So some of the guidelines are saying like, you know, um, you know, two to three days prior, um, you know, I know some surgeons will allow the patient to take it up, uh, to the, uh, the, the day before. Um, and, and then some will allow you to use it, um, post-operatively as the, um, pain management. Now, it may not be adequate if the surgery, you know, is, is, is very extensive and they're going to need some significant um, pain management. That's a scary prospect for those of us who, who understand the risk for a patient who has opioid dependence, because you're basically going backwards. And so if they're going to be put on, you know, hydrocodone, oxycodone, morphine, hopefully that's just in the inpatient setting. And then you can transition them to buprenorphine. Um, But ideally, if you can just you know, go as close up to the sur- surgery uh, date with the buprenorphine, maybe taper down slightly just so that um, when you, um, so that post-operatively you can, you, you have room to titrate up, but you would only do that in a case where they're already on a pretty high dose. Um, but in most cases you use the same dose right up until surgery. And then you use the medication post-operatively if you can. Um, any other, uh, did you want to respond to anything, Kento? Oh yeah, thank you so much. I type on the chat, but the I I typically recommend them uh, to stay on the bup, and because I just personally I've seen there's so many patients who relapsed after being discontinued on the bup, and I think at least in my experience, I can manage the their pain control with using higher dosage of all opioid or using no opioid management too and also if they are in the hospital they can use the nerve block or ketamine drip or other a pathway of the pain management so um my... i yes I, I agree with that and then as far as getting other uh, you know like mid-level providers um, or other um, physicians engaged i think it really just comes down to um showing them you know it's education showing them you know that you know, that you can do it, that they can do it, um, it, bringing them into your process, you know, letting them shadow at your office, you know, offering to provide um, preceptorship um, and, and, and really just um, being a mentor. Um, and, and maybe if you've started a program within your hospital system, you know, uh, let them come work for you part-time. I mean, that's, that's what, that's what I've done. And actually my, I have two, uh, one nurse practitioner that's full-time um, in addiction treatment. I have another one that's working part-time and I have others that ever since I've started now have expressed interest. And so I think it's, it's really just showing them it's not something to be afraid of. 
Yeah, and also I I, I just want to quickly share the one of the good program, the PC PCSS Providers Clinical Support System has a mentoring program for uh, MOED. So if uh, if someone needs the mentoring um, for their growth above and beyond, you know online courses, you know they are fantastic. Uh, educational materials available but the, sometimes uh, app and uh, we have you know a little bit complicated questions so this mentoring program can help you address those a little bit of complicated cases and someone would mentor you, you. yes they i actually used that program when i got started a few years ago and <laughs> okay. he connected me with a doctor over in north carolina who was just so pleasant to talk to on the phone and then i ran into him at a conference and it was so cool i was like I had never met him in person and I knew who he was right away. So, well, thank you very much everyone for attending and um, please feel free to email, email us. Our email addresses are here, here somewhere at the end. So we have some resources here. We do have, we did make the slides available. So, um, uh, but definitely you can use us, you know, utilize all these resources and I think there's our contact information. So please take it down, um, send us an email. We'd love to hear from you guys. And um, we encourage you to um, you know, connect with us through MAFP. We're also involved in ASAM. I'm involved in CMBA. There's plenty of opportunities to get involved, get involved in advocacy, get involved in education and uh, get involved in treatment. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kurt and Kento. And Bill, put the uh, SurveyMonkey link uh, for the uh, uh, evaluation in the chat. We really appreciate you giving feedback, and we hope to see you uh, at our next one in the next month. Thanks, all. All right, thank, thank you, guys. You. Thank you. Bye-bye.